From the beginning, coalition flyers effectively neutralized the Iraqi army's ability to attack. Airstrikes on electrical and oil refining facilities reduced the flow of power by 85 percent and crippled Iraq's ability to resupply its army. Scud missile is a dumb piece of stupid, you know, equipment. Had no right just accidentally hitting one of our barracks like that. But it did. So the psychological aspect of the Scud capability that existed there was was the, was the real impact of it. Not the tactical impact, not the battlefield impact, just the psychology of having to sit there and watch this guy toss Scud missiles at us and not being able to do anything about it or anything effective. Only hours into the air war, Saddam Hussein was left with only a single offensive option. On the second day of the war, Iraq launched eight Scud missiles. Seven of those aimed not at coalition forces, but at Israel. Scuds landing in Tel Aviv and Haifa caused serious injuries and damage. Much like the German rockets of World War II, Scuds have no internal guidance system and are incapable of hitting any target smaller than a city. As a result, their military value is insignificant. Scud missile is a dumb, piece of stupid, you know, equipment. Had no right just accidentally hitting one of our barracks like that. But it did. So the psychological aspect of the Scud capability that existed there was, was, the, was the real impact of it. Not the tactical impact, not the battlefield impact, just the psychology of having to sit there and watch this guy tossed Scud missiles at us and not being able to do anything about it or anything effective. They are a terror weapon and the belief that Saddam Hussein had chemical warheads for his Scuds only increased that fear factor. The targeting of Israel was Saddam Hussein's attempt to fracture the coalition and, in effect, end the war. He knew that Arab states would refuse to fight side by side with the Israelis. If he could provoke a military response, the coalition would collapse. The real key to keeping Israel out of the war was a little-known air defense system that soon became one of the heroes of Desert Storm, the Patriot missile. Our mission is to provide airspace control for friendly fighter forces and also weapons control for those same aircraft. We, uh, we have the mission of intercepting any hostile targets, aircraft that are coming over the border. We also provide uh, early warning of missile attack against specific sites in this area, within our area of responsibility. We had uh, an event this morning where missiles were launched at us from Iraq. Uh, we're still finishing up from that, people going around checking the area, make sure everything is all clear. We work together with the Patriot Missile Defense System uh, forwarding information up the chain of command on exact events of what happened. However, the Patriots' effectiveness as a scud buster has been wildly exaggerated. Patriots missed incoming scuds more often than they hit them. Even a direct hit by a Patriot usually failed to destroy the incoming warhead. Instead, the Patriot merely broke the scuds up. Saddam's missiles, inaccurate to begin with, were simply blown off their already erratic course to land in a different part of the target city. The coalition, issuing press releases with glowing reports of the Patriots' accuracy, knew this. But the Patriot hype served its purpose. The Scud was a terror weapon, and what was needed to counter it was an anti-terror weapon. The Patriot was a remarkably effective propaganda tool it kept Israel out of the war. General Chuck Horner later described the strategy openly saying, who cares if they ever really intercepted a Scud? The perception was that they did. If you have an anti-terror weapon that people perceive works, then it works. Even with the Patriots in place, the Scuds kept coming. We had a Scud alert when we went back to draw the new tanks quite a few times and out in the field, 
you know, we took – we stayed in mop two a lot of the time, okay? We had uh, our mop suits on, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of times we'd have our boots. So, you know, if, a, if an alert was called, you could don your mask and put on your chemical gloves and, you know, get everything sealed up like it's supposed to be. Um, had a couple guys. You know, some of the equipment we had when we first got there was the old M25 mask, and I'm sure they used it back through the 60, maybe the 48. You know, it was just a one-piece face shield mask. <coughs> and uh, a couple people had problems with them. And, I mean, they freaked, even though, you know, we didn't actually get the, the chemical didn't hit us. But, I mean, I'm glad I didn't have a problem with it. A lot of people were really scared about that. Yeah, I remember the first night, January 17th, when we heard about the first airstrikes. Um, we had just actually gone to bed that night, and uh, one of the girls came in our tent and said, they just announced on the radio, they are just attacking. So I was like, girls, get your, get your gas mask ready. And sure enough, five, ten minutes later, the chemical alarms go off, and we all head for the chemical treatment plant where we were working at that time at Camp Eagle 2. And we ended up there for, I think, five or ten minutes later, they were calling all clear over the radio. That was a relief to know that we had at least overprepared and that uh, it was not going to be as bad as we thought. But uh, the chemical alarms did keep us busy most of the night, most of the time, because they would fire a scud. As soon as they'd fire it, they'd sound the chemical alarms because we honestly didn't know. It was a chemical scud or a high explosive scud, most of which were high explosive. The Patriot batteries were stationed there where we were at at Camp Eagle 2, and uh, they didn't know their capability. So the first scud that came flying toward our camp, they fired 14 Patriots at it. The first one took it out, and the Air 13 just kept on going. So they realized, okay, our technology is also superior. We learned immediately. And so it was, it was a learning curve for everybody, honestly, at the beginning of the air war. You'd lay down to sleep and wake up and almost be drowning in the sweat and stuff that's in your mask, you know, from where you're sleeping. And, uh, you know, we, I mean, you get used to it, but, I mean, it's still hot. Not quite as hot as being in port. On February 25th, a scud struck a barracks in Duran, killing 28 Americans. A nearby Patriot fire unit should have intercepted the incoming missile, but the crew never saw it. That was in Dahran. Um, ironically, uh, my next door neighbor was a major with the reserves. It was a reserve unit that had gotten hit and had lost, I think, 21 people. And my next door neighbor back home in, in Pennsylvania, in Concord, in Pennsylvania, he was mobilized and we ran into each other after the war. We actually ran into each other before the war. But uh, after the war, he was telling me about how difficult that was. He would describe the Patriot would go up and you would hear a loud, high pitched pop and that would take care of Scud. The night he was supposed to be in the barracks where those young men and women were killed, most of them in their early 20s, reservists from Pennsylvania. And uh, he, was, he went off to get a cup of coffee to write a letter to his wife that night. And it was becoming normal place to hear a Patriot go up and you hear the loud pitch pop. I mean, it just became part of the everyday routine to hear that. And that night he was writing a letter and he heard a low bass thud and the ground underneath him shook. And uh, he, very difficult to hear him recall that. Designed to operate for only eight hours at a time, many Patriot units were kept on alert 18 to 20 hours a day. Weakened batteries had caused the tracking software to malfunction, allowing the scud to slip through and land intact. Israel pressed the coalition for a more reliable fix. Schwarzkopf ordered what became known as the Great Scud Hunt. This search for mobile Scud launchers occupied hundreds of coalition aircraft. It was a disaster for us. Uh, we, we took an awful lot of sorties, and some of our best high-quality sorties, a lot of F-15E sorties, which is the two-place version, the ground attack version of the F-15, probably our most capable weapon system. And we took them off of every other 
thing they might be involved in and committed them to try to hunt down scuds and kill them before they could be fired at Saudi Arabia and Israel. But mostly because the psychological impact that had in Israel gave us fits. We didn't want the Israelis getting in this. It would have unraveled the coalition had they done so. Uh, so stopping the scud attacks on Israel was a big issue for us. And the, you know, the Army lost 20 or 21 people in that barracks in Dharan. It was hit by a Scud missile. That was our biggest loss in the whole war. So uh, it, took, it drained off a lot of high-quality sorties that we could have used in other places. And in general, we weren't effective in stopping those attacks. Now, if you take, if you plot those attacks, you know, in an Excel spreadsheet, you'll see they peaked early and went down. So in general, you know, we, we, we chopped the frequency of it, and towards the end, they were having to fire out of Baghdad, which took Israel out. Uh, they couldn't get to Israel out of Baghdad. They had to drive out into the desert towards ba uh, Israel to have the range to get to Tel Aviv. So we helped, but it was kind of frustrating for me that we couldn't really hermetically just strangle that and, and put an end to it. We did not. It's one of the reasons why I think missile defense is very important for this country, by the way. It's defense against, uh, you know, if we last a thousand years, and we hope we do, will, hope this United States lasts a thousand years and longer, somebody's going to attack us with missiles. And we don't have a missile defense today, and we could have. The technical problems are difficult, but we know how to solve them, most of them, all of them. Uh, it's the political and bureaucratic problem that we haven't been able to solve. And part of that is inner service politics. Who's going to operate missile defense? You know, is that the Air Force? Is that the Army? Is that the Navy on, off of boats? Who's going to do it? That has uh, been as big a problem as any in trying to solve this is, is uh, trying to protect rice bowls. You know, who gets the mission? That's, that's a terrible commentary on uh, senior service leaders who, who should put the country's interest ahead of their organization, certainly. Although aerial surveillance could easily pinpoint the location of a launch, well-trained Iraqi crews could be packed up and on the move in 10 minutes, safely hidden away long before the attackers arrived. Despite the limited damage inflicted by Iraqi missiles, the coalition committed important air assets and special forces units to eliminating the Scuds and their launchers. The U.S. Air Force organized air patrols over areas where Scud launchers were suspected to operate, namely western Iraq near the Jordanian border where the Scuds were fired at Israel and southern Iraq where they were aimed at Saudi Arabia. A-10 strike aircraft flew over these zones during the day, and F-15Es fitted with lantern pods and synthetic aperture radars patrolled at night. However, the infrared and radar signatures of the Iraqi TELs were almost impossible to distinguish from ordinary trucks and from the surrounding electromagnetic clutter. While patrolling, strike aircraft managed to sight their targets on 42 occasions, but they were only able to acquire them long enough to release their ordnance three times. In addition, the Iraqi missile units dispersed their Scud tells and hid them in culverts, wadis, or under highway bridges. They also practiced shoot and scoot tactics, withdrawing the launcher to a hidden location immediately after it had fired, while the launch sequence that usually took 90 minutes was reduced to half an hour. This enabled them to preserve their forces, despite optimistic claims by the coalition. A post-war Pentagon study concluded that relatively few launchers had been destroyed by coalition aircraft. Ground-based special forces from the United Kingdom were sent to scout for launchers behind enemy lines, in some cases attacking them directly with Mylan man-portable missiles. A patrol that used the call sign Bravo 220 was captured by the Iraqis. The mobility of Scud tells 
allowed for a choice of firing positions and increased the survivability of the weapon system to such an extent that of the approximately 100 launchers claimed destroyed by coalition pilots and special forces in the Gulf War, not a single destruction could be confirmed afterwards. After the war, UNSCOM investigations showed that Iraq still had 12 MAZ-543 vehicles, as well as seven Al-Walid and Al-Nadal launchers and 62 complete Al-Hussein missiles. The missiles and Saddam's ability to make them remained virtually intact. The commander of coalition forces, General Norman Schwarzkopf, called it preparing the battlefield. He knew that neither intense diplomatic efforts nor the condemnations of the United Nations were likely to persuade Iraq to leave Kuwait. The problem would be decided by military action and by battle on the ground. For his ground offensive to work, the opposing Iraqi land forces had to be hit hard from the air. The Iraqis possessed the fourth largest army in the world. They were well equipped and dug in. They needed to be softened up. This is where air power was brought into play with devastating effect. From the start of the shooting in January 1991, Iraq's ground forces were subject to incessant attack. By the end of the month, as the interdiction campaign progressively smashed Iraq's air power, command and control networks, more and more coalition air assets were free to be turned against Iraq's troops, artillery positions, supply centers, and lines of communications, destroying their effectiveness for the land battle to come. It was incredible. I'd never seen such a display of flying power in all my life. I mean, you would look up and you would just see uh, everything. The black specks of the B-52, they're so high up, and you see the lower flying aircraft, the F-14s, the F-18s. And as you're looking up, suddenly you're just out of, uh, just out of relapse or out of uh, reaction. You're ducking because A-10s just flew over your head because they keep up with the sand dunes. Uh, and so it was incredible. At that same time, the Marine Expeditionary Force were mounting false amphibious assaults. Um, they would try to charge toward the one island. Uh, there was an island just off of Kuwait City in the Persian Gulf that Saddam had also secured. The MEF would uh, mount up and do practice runs on that island, and they would just stop short of the island, turn around, and come back to their base. And so there was a lot of fear tactics that we were using at that point, uh, using a lot of uh, putting up, t taking damaged fuel lines, damaged helicopters, uh, damaged fueling trucks, things that we cannot use setting them out in the middle of nowhere and just piling it up and making it look like it's operational to Iraqi intelligence and they would in turn divert whole divisions of troops over because we had them thinking we were going to do something there. And what it did, it ended up effectively in many ways dividing up the Iraqi army before we even started fighting them. Giant B-52 bombers unloaded thousands of tons of explosives on Iraq's best troops, the Republican Guard which was being held back as a mobile reserve. The EW called out the possibility of a threat. Uh, the Iraqis had gotten pretty smart and they did not turn their radars on for any length of time. We had an explosion uh, on the left side of the aircraft that we could tell was aft. It caused the aircraft to roll in about 10 or 15 degrees of bank. Uh, it was hard to tell because, like I said, we were in the process of uh, doing uh, S-turns the way it was. And when I looked out, I saw one go just uh, off to my right side, just in front of the wing, and then a second one about, what I think, about uh, oh, 100 yards or so to the right of the aircraft. So the maneuvering and the, uh, and the uh, jamming that the EW was doing probably saved, well, I'll, he did save uh, us from taking at least two more, if not three more hits. I wasn't too concerned about the situation until I read the maintenance report of all the near misses and the and the possible uh, damage that could have been done and the over 65 holes that were in the airplane. When I saw that, then I wished I could have had a cold drink of some kind. Clearly, the coalition ground offensive was coming, but without aerial reconnaissance, the Iraqis could not know when and where. The Iraqi forces could do little to interrupt the constant bombardment. Their battlefield air defense system had been reduced to limited numbers of missiles and obsolete gun systems. Although a small number of Allied aircraft were shot down or damaged, the devastation of Iraq's army was complete. Once the fighting started, you know, he 
was disconnected from the theater. We put out, we, we, his command and control system went down immediately. So he could not receive reports from the front or give orders to anybody. That's why like 100,000 or so, maybe more, Iraqi soldiers deserted. You know, they weren't hearing anything from Baghdad. As far as they knew, they had just been staked out in the desert and left to die. So uh, uh, our, our initial targeting uh, included the command and control apparatus, the telephone system, uh, landlines, uh, of course, we had other priority targets. We thought, we knew they had a, a, a nuclear weapons program, and we put, we started the war with something like a dozen targets that were rela related to that activity. And then right at the end, the CIA came in with a bunch more. It was too late, you know, but, um, so we had uh, their command and control system, their weapons of mass destruction, programs, those were high priority targets from the first night. And, but we essentially uh, put him out of business. He, he, he couldn't even get, he couldn't get news and he couldn't give orders. And so the brain went dead immediately. We attacked the ner central nervous system. Didn't make any difference how much muscle he had after that. He had no control of it. When the coalition ground force moved, it moved fast. The assault burst upon the Iraqi army on March 24th. U.S. Marines, U.S. Army, Saudi, Kuwaiti, Egyptian, Syrian, and other Arab forces poured into Kuwait through engineer-blasted gaps in the Iraqi defenses. Far to the west, American airborne and air assault troops, in company with a French light armored division, were racing north through the Iraqi desert heading for the Euphrates, with the aim of cutting off all Iraqi forces in the Kuwait theater of operations. In the center came the main punch, the U.S. Army's 7th Corps, a heavily armored five-division force, including the British 1st Armored Division, drove along the Kuwait-Iraq border, outflanking the main defense lines and engaging the Republican Guard. Already demoralized by weeks of bombing, they gave themselves up by the thousands. Clearing the minefields was the Blue 82. The Blue 82 was originally designed to clear helicopter landing zones and artillery emplacements in Vietnam. South Vietnamese VNAF aircraft dropped Blue 82 bombs on NVA positions in desperation to support Arvin troops in the Battle of Zwan Lok in the last days of the Vietnam War. Eleven Blue 82Bs were pelletized and dropped in five night missions during the Gulf War, all from Special Operations MC-130 combat talons. The initial drop tested the ability of the bomb to clear or breach minefields, However, no reliable assessments of mine clearing effectiveness are publicly available. Later, bombs were dropped as much for their psychological effect as for their anti-personnel effects. The U.S. Air Force would later drop several Blue 82s during the campaign to destroy Taliban and Al-Qaeda bases in Afghanistan, to attack and demoralize personnel, and to destroy underground and cave complexes. American forces began using the bomb in November 2001 and again a month later during the Battle of Tora Bora. On July 15, 2008, airmen from the Duke Field 711th Special Operations Squadron, 919th Special Operations Wing, dropped the last operational Blue 82 at the Utah Test and Training Range. Fixed-wing close air support was provided in the main by Air Force F-16s, A-10s, and Marine Corps AV-8Bs. The A-10s huge gun and powerful weapon load ripped through Iraqi artillery and armor with ease. Two A-10s established a record at the end of the war by destroying 35 tanks in a day. Well, the basic mission of the A-10 is close air support. Currently, until the ground war starts uh, underway, we're doing a lot of uh, AI missions and OCA missions targeting SCUDs as well as uh, EW sites and we're actually uh, doing some SAM site targeting. It's back to the old stick and rudder flying. It's not an electric jet. It's got two hydraulic systems. The stick moves, the plane moves. You can feel it. Uh, you can feel the nuances in each jet. Uh, you still use the rudder in the plane when you're flying it. 
and it's more back to the old style flying. The final impetus to surrender came when the close support aircraft brought the battle to a close by annihilating the massive Iraqi column fleeing from Kuwait along the Basra Road, which became known as the Highway of Death. On the night of February 26, 27, retreating Iraqi military personnel were attacked by American aircraft and ground forces on Highway 80, leading north to Iraq. The scenes of devastation on the road are some of the most recognizable images of the war. Spotting the massive Iraqi columns, U.S. Marine aircraft blocked the road in front of the retreating troops with anti-tank mines, and then bombed the rear of the massive vehicle column of mostly Iraqi regular army forces. This effectively boxed in the Iraqi forces, creating an enormous traffic jam and leaving the Iraqi troops as sitting targets for follow-up airstrikes. Over the next 10 hours, scores of Marine, Navy and Air Force pilots attacked the convoy using a variety of ordnance. Some survivors of the air attacks were later engaged by arriving coalition ground units, while the vehicles that managed to evade the traffic jam and continued to drive on the road north were often targeted individually. One portion of the road, at the bottleneck, had been reduced to a long, uninterrupted line of more than 300 stuck and abandoned vehicles. The wreckage found on the highway consisted of military vehicles and many more commandeered civilian vehicles, such as cars and buses. Many of these vehicles were filled with stolen Kuwaiti property. It was horrific. You, I mean, you see mangled bodies and, you know, burnt, charred, remains and um, it's uh, it's pretty I mean when you're 19 you're not afraid of death well that will make you afraid of death when you see the the really ugly side you know the guy that's been cooked alive and um, you know the the a-10s had come in and, and hit this one column that we ran across and they had just ripped it apart uh, you know you see the the awesome destructive capability that you know we wield and how it can just mangle and destroy flesh and you'd see these packs of dogs running around uh, that were obviously eating corpses. You know, you see, I me remember it like it was yesterday. We saw one dog that was running with a hand in its mouth like that. You know, so us being more or less a, a gang of rednecks, of course, we kill the dogs. You know, because once they get the taste of flesh, they'll want nothing more. But uh, it, it, was, it was absolutely very humbling to see how small that you really are in the, in the universal scope of things when you see how you can just be ripped apart like that, you know, for nothing. And you see these people and you're like, half of these guys were conscripts that were just trying to get, get back home. You know, they just didn't, they were forced kind of into this situation. When you look back on it, you understand that they were pretty much just gathered up and thrown into this situation. And their officers left them. Some of them were chained inside their tanks so they couldn't run. Uh, you know, you, there's a lot of horrible things going on. Uh, you know, a lot of bodies. A lot of just stinking, rotten bodies and blown up equipment. The death toll from the attack is unknown and still remains a controversial issue. Some independent estimates go as high as 10,000 or even tens of thousands of casualties, but this is highly unlikely. According to a 2003 study by the Project on Defense Alternatives Research, there were probably about 7,500 to 10,000 people who rode in the cut-off main caravan to begin with. But once the bombing started, most of them are believed to have simply left their vehicles in panic and escaped through the desert or into the nearby swamps. 450 to 500 of them were taken prisoner. The actual figure was probably a minimum toll of at least 500 to 600 dead, which seems to be more plausible. On and near Highway 8 to the east, Iraqi forces were trying to either redeploy, to stand and fight, or simply escape. Many of them belonged to the elite Iraqi Republican Guard's 1st Armored Division. This elite force was engaged by the U.S. ground forces, consisting of nine artillery battalions and a battalion of AH-64 Apache helicopter gunships. Hundreds of Iraqi vehicles were systematically destroyed along a 50-mile stretch of the highway and at scattered points across the desert. This engagement, which wasn't known to media and the public, 
still remains relatively obscure, even as the most of the graphic images of scorched corpses, commonly attributed to the highway of death attacks and often considered among the iconic images of the war, were actually taken on Highway 8 and not on Highway 80. A large column of remnants of the Hammurabi Division attempting to withdraw to safety in Baghdad were also engaged and obliterated a few days later, deep inside the Iraqi territory in a controversial post-war turkey shoot style incident known as the Battle of Rumelia. We try to be as professional in our job as the people in the Air Force are, are in theirs. But uh, to tell you the truth, it helps my morale, I think, more than any lift we can give anybody else's morale because to see people pulling together in such good spirit as we've seen out here today, uh, I'm not afraid to use the word inspiring. It inspires me, I'll tell you. In just under 100 hours, the half a million strong Iraqi force in Kuwait and southern Iraq was finished and Kuwait was liberated. The early air power advocates, the Billy Mitchells, you know, people like that, said this is a revolutionary capability because we're going to win wars quickly and easily with minimum of casualties and so forth. Then along came World War II and 8th Air Force lost more people than the entire Marine Corps lost in World War II. You know, we, we think about invading Okinawa and Iwo Jima and Tarawa and so forth and how many people the Marines lost. 8th Air Force by itself lost more air crewmen than the entire U.S. Marine Corps did in World War II. So the air power hadn't made war easier up to that point for our guys anyway. But along came Desert Storm and the Air Force loses 20 people in a 44-day war. And our total losses, Army, Marines, everybody, Navy, 140, something like that. And we knock over a very big uh, army, okay, that had had a 10-year war with Iran and acquitted itself pretty well. So uh, here we finally made the dreams of the air power advocates come true. Iraq lost a total of 259 aircraft in the war, 122 of which were lost in combat. During Desert Storm, 36 aircraft were shot down in aerial combat. Three helicopters and two fighters were shot down during the invasion of Kuwait on August 2, 1990. Kuwait claims to have shot down as many as 37 Iraqi aircraft. These claims have not been confirmed. In addition, 68 fixed-wing aircraft and 13 helicopters were destroyed while on the ground, and 137 aircraft were flown to Iran and never returned. The coalition lost 52 fixed-wing aircraft and 23 helicopters during Desert Storm, with 39 fixed-wing aircraft and five helicopters lost in combat. One coalition fighter may have been lost in air-to-air -air combat, a U.S. Navy F.A. 18 piloted by Scott Spiker. Other claims include an RAF Tornado GR-1A piloted by Gary Lennox and Adrian Weeks. However, the tornado in question crashed to the ground due to pilot error on a different date than the supposed air-to-air -air kill is claimed to have taken place. One B-52G was lost while returning to its operating base on Diego Garcia when it suffered a catastrophic electrical failure and crashed into the Indian Ocean, killing three of the six crew members on board. The rest of the coalition losses came from anti-aircraft fire. The Americans lost 28 fixed-wing aircraft and five helicopters. The British lost seven fixed-wing aircraft. The Saudi Arabians lost two, the Italians lost one, and the Kuwaitis lost one. During the invasion of Kuwait on August 2, 1990, the Kuwaiti Air Force lost 12 fixed-wing aircraft, which were destroyed on the ground, and eight helicopters, six of which were shot down, two of which were destroyed while on the ground. I wasn't disappointed to be done in 43 days, 44 days. But I was disappointed that it ended when it did. We were about 24 to 48 hours 
from closing the loop across the top. You remember the, the Marine Corps did a direct frontal assault on Kuwait City, directly up the highway, and the Army did this big looping left hook to try to cut off the, the theater and uh, capture essentially the equipment. Didn't much care about these young teenage soldiers, but we wanted to leave the Iraqi army without a lot of heavy equipment. We would, we would have trapped it in theater. For a variety of reasons, I believe we stopped a couple of days short. And as a consequence, much of the equipment was salvaged by the Iraqi army and used immediately against the Shiite, the so-called Marsh Arabs down in the, you know, towards the uh, Gulf, and the Kurds, because, you know, almost immediately there was a revolt in the south, down around Basra, and up in the Kurdish territory, and this, these revolts were put down quite savagely by uh, equipment, including armed helicopters, that was sort of rescued from the theater by the fact that we stopped maybe 24, 48 hours too early. Now, I understand why we stopped, and I did not have the courage at the time to argue forcefully that we should continue for a couple of days, because I looking around the room, everybody else thought it was a good idea. Colin Powell was concerned about two things. One, we had been on a kind of worldwide public opinion high, and now we were killing people, Iraqi teenagers in large numbers. We had scenes like the highway of death leading north out of Kuwait City, and our public affairs image was beginning to turn brown, you know, at the edges. Powell was worried about that, and, it, and he was right to worry about it. And the other thing he worried about was Iran. We were about to emasculate the Iraqi armed forces that were really the counterbalance for Iran at the north end of the Persian Gulf. And so I think he made the mistake of recommending that we stop uh, and convincing both Schwarzkopf and the president that we had done enough. You know, this was a magnificent victory, as it was, and that we should call a halt before it turned into something that was really a little more than we wanted. I would have argued that we should continue for another 24 to 48 hours. I think if we had, Saddam would have fallen. We would have never had Iraq II and all the trouble associated with that and so forth. But, you know, 2020 hindsight is not good enough, and I certainly didn't stand up on my hind legs and demand that the president take a phone call from me that continue the war. Actually, I was sitting with the rest of the chiefs over in the Pentagon when Powell called back from the White House and told the vice chairman, Dave Jeremiah, that the president had decided to stop at midnight tonight. And uh, so I, I sort of got the news along with everybody else and didn't have a chance to uh, intervene had I wanted to, but I wouldn't have anyway. When Operation Desert Storm ended in 1991, the safety of Kurds who were fleeing from Iraqi persecution from the south became an issue, and Operation Provide Comfort began. This operation essentially created a northern no-fly zone to Iraqi military aircraft. The operation provided the Kurdish population with humanitarian aid and reassurance of safe skies. However, this was marred by a friendly fire incident on April 14, 1994, when two United States Air Force F-15 Eagle fighters mistakenly shot down two U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters, killing 26 personnel. Operation Provide Comfort officially ended on the 31st of December, 1996. Following Operation Provide Comfort, the United States continued to watch over the northern skies with the launching of Operation Northern Watch on January 1st, 1997. 
Operation Northern Watch continued to provide air security to the Kurdish population in the north. By 1999, the Department of Defense had flown over 200,000 sorties over Iraq. American and British aircraft continuously maintained the integrity of the no-fly zone, receiving anti-aircraft fire from Iraqi forces almost daily. The operation ran until its conclusion on May 1, 2003. In the south, Operation Southern Watch was underway to watch over the persecuted Shiite populations. This operation was launched on August 27, 1992, with the mission of preventing further inhumane acts against civilian populations. Iraq challenged the no-fly zone beginning in December 1992, when a US F-16 shot down a MiG which had locked onto it in the southern no-fly zone. The next month, Allied planes attacked Iraqi SAM sites in the south and bombed a suspected nuclear facility. Baghdad eventually halted firing on patrolling Allied aircraft after August 1993.